Hello everyone, this is LB3 of LB3 Scouting, and I am joined by Milk, who is going to be doing this podcast with me that we're calling Draft Duos. We are going to be talking weekly about the NFL draft and prospects that we like and things like that. This is the first episode, so we appreciate we will appreciate any feedback that we get, and we hope that you enjoy. So let's uh, get into it. Milk, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello everyone, my name is Milk. I do a lot of scouting, uh, especially on for the NFL Draft subreddit. Uh, I do a lot of stuff there. I do a lot of scouting reports. I break down a lot of interesting uh, matchups weekly. I started doing that last year. I had a ton of fun with it, so I continued that this year. And uh, I'm uh, I'm glad to be on on the show with you, LB3. I can't wait to talk some football with you. Yeah, I'm really excited too. This is my first experience podcasting, so I'm excited to see how it goes. And I hope that we can keep this up weekly and build a nice little audience. Absolutely, same here. All right, so first off, I thought it would be nice, as this is a draft podcast, to talk about the first week of college football, which has happened this past week, and talk about three I, – I, we, before we started, I had you pick out three players that you thought stood out in the first week of college football, and I did the same. So how about you start by saying one of your players, and we can uh, just talk about it. All right, so personally, I'm more of a defensive guy myself. I love the defensive side of the football. It, uh, it's always fascinated me uh, how – Teams are able to defend all these crazy concepts that that new coaches and coordinators are throwing out each year. Uh, so I went to the defensive side of the football for my first one, and that is Stanford cornerback Paulson Adebo. He had an unbelievable game uh, on Saturday afternoon against Northwestern. Two pass breakups, one inter- one great interception from the slot, no less, as well as top five tackles. He was targeted five times, only allowed one reception for seven yards. Uh, I thought he had an excellent day. He showed off his athleticism, ball skills, and length. And, yeah, he's my first guy. Uh, yeah, so I actually haven't had much of an opportunity to get around to uh, Debo yet. So what would, you, what would you say, what kind? Of, what style would you say he is? Would you say he's more of a, uh, a zone guy, a man guy? I mean, personally, I think he's going to be able to do both at the next level. Um, I think, you know, right now he's – you want to get him up at the line of scrimmage and, you know, in man so he can use that length. Uh, he's about 6'1", pretty long arms. Uh, but he can he does a good job with, with his eyes to the quarterback in zone as well in terms of breaking on the ball and, you know, using his length to disrupt uh, the uh, catching pocket for the receiver. Uh, mm-hmm. Does a good job of getting pass breakups last year, or, you know, getting pass breakups in general. I believe he led the nation last year in passes defensed. So obviously that kind of tells you what he can do. Uh, Stanford had him playing, uh, you know, both man and zone. So he's pretty, you know, he even though he only started was a full time starter last year, he still has some experience in both. So I think at the next level he can kind of be a do it all guy. And I think what impressed me the most is that he got a pick from the slot uh, on Saturday, where you know he's usually a boundary guy, but if he's someone that can play very well, at a high level in the slot, then all of a sudden he could really become a true shadow your number one guy. Uh, yeah, I would say that, uh, that he definitely interests me. I mean, this is a, definitely a cornerback class that might bring about uh, a revolution in the past defense game in the NFL. With like guy, There's a lot of larger corners that still have plenty of athleticism and plenty of talent. I mean, guy, Trevon Diggs, Christian Fulton... Uh, Jeffrey Okuda, there's so many. And Paul Sandibo is one of those guys who has good size, good athleticism, and he has all the technique that you could want, and he is probably going to end up being dominant at the next level. Yeah, I absolutely love Adebo. So let's go to your first guy now. Uh, yeah, so I actually, I, I started, when I started scouting, it was with wide receivers, and I still think that's the position that I'm best at scouting. And so... I actually started in 2017, so since then there haven't been a lot of great wide receiver prospects, but still, you know, some good ones. But easily the best one that I've ever seen who had a great week one is Jerry Judy from Alabama. He's uh, the number one player on my board, big board, which we'll get to later, but he just looked absolutely dominant. He didn't look like he's ready to slow down. He's going to just run over everyone that he plays. No one can cover him. It's just there's nothing that you can do against him. His route running is perfect. Hand usage, foot usage, really he does everything that you want out of a wide receiver. Yeah, I am absolutely in love with Judy as a prospect. Uh, 
think he's phenomenal. He does pretty much everything well. Uh, you know, the hands, the route running, the yak ability, uh, just his overall athleticism is phenomenal. And yeah, I I think he's really a home run prospect. Uh, but what do you think? And what do you think about his you know lack of elite physical tools? Uh, the thing with Judy is that I think that he's going to be good enough athletically, and then I think that he does everything else so insanely well that he can easily make up for all of that other stuff. Like he doesn't, he may not be a four-three guy, but he is so good at route running that wide receiver, that cornerbacks are still going to have to slack off ten yards to try and cover him because they can't possibly expect to like stick with him and cover him with his route running because they are going to bite on his double moves. They won't see slants coming. Every little aspect of his movement is very refined, and that kind of refinement really helps in making up for other aspects, like the lack of speed that other receivers might have, like rugs, for example. Yeah, I'm with you all the way. I'm not really concerned at all about the fact that he isn't, you know, 6'4", 220 or anything like that. I think with the fantastic traits that he does possess, uh, I think they outweigh not being an extremely, you know, great physical player, but I think he's phenomenal nonetheless. Okay, so let's move on to your second player that you brought uh, that had a big uh, performance in Week 1. Yeah, my second player is junior Wisconsin running back Jonathan Taylor. He had an excellent game against South Florida and answered a lot of questions that I had about him. Uh, mainly, the thing that I was most concerned about was Taylor's ball security. Uh, I believe he had two or six fumbles in two years, and he was clean on the night. No fumbles, great job. Uh, he also had two catches for two touchdowns in his game, which I thought was really yeah, impressive. Yeah, his first uh, receiving touchdown of his college career. Very good sign. Exactly. He uh, it looked like he had soft hands. Uh, the coordination was there, and uh, I thought that was really impressive. He also, you know, obviously he showed off the power and the straight line speed, but I was also very impressed by his agility. Uh, he was able to make guys miss in one-on-one -on -one situations, and he was able to get a ton of yards after that. I think it was super impressive that he was able to show that he's not just a straight line runner and that he's going to be able to, you know, not only have – the speed to hit home runs, but the agility to make guys miss as well. Uh, yeah, he, he was great. And uh, actually, segueing into my next guy is actually another running back who also performed very well uh, and is considered a top, pro top prospect as well. And that's Travis, I don't want to say his name, Travis Etienne. Uh, not exactly sure how to say his last name, but the Clemson running back, Travis Etienne, had a great game. He had 17 yards per carry on 12 carries and three touchdowns, and he just looked like his normal self. Obviously, he wasn't the best opponent, Georgia Tech, but he, he looked like he normally does. He is insanely fast. No other running back in this draft class has a gear like he does. He, he has underrated power for his size and great agility. There's really, uh, unlike Taylor, he actually didn't prove much in the passing game, which is something that I'd like to see him do more. But for a player of his ability there's not a lot of things that i have questions about i would i'm excited to see him against some better competition uh in the, later in the season and actually i think next week they play texas a&m and i highlighted that in my draft video video on my channel because i think that's a good matchup for him and hopefully he can produce to the normal level that he normally does so why don't you go ahead and give us your third and final guy that you want to go over uh my third one is chris young the Ohio State defensive end. Yeah, Chase Young had an excellent afternoon against uh, FAU. He was his typical Chase Young self. Chase Young. I don't know why I said Chris Young. Chase Young, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, Chase Young was absolutely crazy. You know, he's – there's no other uh, – I'm just going to keep using giant hyperbole, but no other defensive end in this class has his combination of size, speed, and power – He's just a rare specimen as a defensive end, and he's going to go high in the draft because of that. And it deserve it, deservedly so. And I'm very excited to see more of him, especially, once again, just like all a lot of these other guys we've talked about as he gets to play better competition later in the season. But he had a great start, and he really couldn't have asked for more. Yeah, Chase Young is, well, he is pretty great. He, he's awesome. So if you want to, who is your, if you want to talk about your third guy... 
yeah, so, like I said, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to kind of double dip with a pair of linebackers that played on Friday night in uh, the marquee game, which was uh, between Utah State and Wake Forest. Um, obviously, that night, all eyes were on Utah State quarterback uh, Jordan Love, but... I kind of found the star of the show to be both linebackers on each side. You had Utah State linebacker David Woodward, who had 24 tackles, two forced fumbles, and should have had a third for a touchdown, but was called back for a defensive holding. He also had a sack as well. Um, he was all over the place. He looked like he had really good instincts and a nose for the ball, so that was good to see. And then on the other side, Justin uh, Sternad is how I think his name is pronounced. He had 12 tackles, including, I believe, uh, a fourth and shortstop. He also had a pick on the final drive of the game of Jordan Love. And uh, he should have had another one earlier, but it kind of dropped through his hand. So he showed athleticism and uh, good coverage skills and good skills against the run. So overall, good good nights for both players. And I was really impressed by both of them. I mean, yeah, with this linebacker class, you really have to start, especially with Dylan Moses injured, you really got to start digging deep into prospects people normally wouldn't think of to try and find guys who might climb up because it's, it's really, after Dylan Moses, there's really not a lot of guys that are pushing for the first round. Maybe Isaiah Simmons, but he's more, he could be considered a safety by some. So really, linebackers, it's really, it's really thin at the top right now. So there's a lot of potential for guys who aren't being heralded right now to climb. So big performances like that are definitely really important for these like less heralded guys. And on top of that, I, I, so I didn't tell you this, but I decided to also bring a worst matchup, worst performance of the week. So I just wanted to give a special little shout out to Kendrick Rogers, who is uh, a wide receiver with Texas A&M, and he had one catch for 12 yards. Now Kendrick Rogers has uh, a very rare combination of his size speed, and his, he has very strong hands. And last year against Clemson, he went 7 for 120, put himself on the map, and then he really didn't produce much after that. And so in some part of that was health. There's a lot of reasons for all of this. So part of, people were expecting him to maybe come into this season hot, get started hot, try and put himself in a first-round conversation, and a 1 for 12, cat, 12 yards line is not what we're looking for. And now he plays Clemson again, so maybe he can just have – maybe he just only goes off against Clemson. I guess we'll see. So that's definitely a matchup to watch. And we're going to take that and segue into the matchups that we are looking forward to in Week 2. And the, my first one is going to be Kendrick Rogers versus A.J. Terrell. Uh, A.J. Terrell is Clemson cornerback. He's big, strong. Uh, I mean, he's not really pushing for the first round right now, but with a good year, he easily could. And Kendrick Rogers is a guy who is very tough to stop when he's at his best, but is rarely at his best. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that game goes especially how close Texas A&M played Clemson last year. Yeah, Jimbo's, you know, he's definitely going to have those Aggie boys ready for that uh, huge matchup against Clemson, just like he did last year. But I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Kendrick needs a good game. He needs a big game to really put himself on the map, and he needs to be able to do that consistently throughout the year. But he's going to get a very good test in uh, against A.J. Terrell. Yeah. It, it is, he definitely needs to start performing if he wants to push himself into the first round conversation or even day two conversation. Yeah, in a week with a lot of interesting cornerback wide receiver matchups, this one is could be the most fascinating simply because, I mean, not only does Kendrick Rogers need a good game, but I think A.J. Terrell could really use a, a good game as well. I think uh, one of my matchups to watch, and it's a bit of a less no, lesser known guy, and it has to deal with a guy that I actually just watched like literally last night but a guy that I actually thought was kind of interesting um, and that is North Carolina right tackle Charlie Heck uh, the uh, coming off of a comeback win against so the South Carolina Gamecocks the North Carolina Tar Heels are then gonna have to go on a turnaround and face the Miami Hurricanes so right tackle Charlie Heck who is a guy with NFL bloodlines his dad uh was an All-American player in college, spent some time in the NFL, is a current offensive line coach. I don't exactly remember where. His brother uh, also played ball in 2016. I think it was at UNC as well. Uh, so he's got you know NFL bloodlines. He's got football bloodlines. He's going to be going up against Trayvon Hill and Jonathan Garvin. 
uh, for the Miami Hurricanes. Two guys who, while are interesting, kind of need to make more of an impact than they did Week 0 against Florida. I mean, yeah, they the Miami pass rushers are definitely better than the ones he was facing against in South Carolina. But I, I haven't personally watched Heck yet, and I, I'm definitely intrigued because after the, there's a couple offensive tackles that are really pushing for the first round, but the depth right now is kind of questionable in, in what I've seen at least. And that that's something that really grows with the season. Depth in the offensive line isn't something that people really talk about early on. But it's, there, it's definitely a thing where offensive line depth in the NFL is extremely thin. So finding guys that can come in and be good backups or even push for starting roles immediately is great. And teams love these people with NFL bloodlines. I mean, that's there may not be any real reason to it, but teams like it when players have NFL players as parents and uncles and stuff like that. Yeah, and just to give uh, people listening context, Charlie Heck is about 6'7", 315, so he's a big boy. He's actually got some pretty nimble feet. He's not, I didn't notice him being a plotter, um, and he started uh, his redshirt sophomore year at 2017 at right tackle. He started uh, his redshirt junior year last year at right tackle as well. Uh, he's going to be there for his fifth year, senior year. Uh, 2019 as well. I mean, he's gone up against the likes of Bradley Chubb. And to be honest, in that North Carolina State game, he survived against Chubb. I mean, Chubb got him here and there, but he didn't allow any sacks to Chubb. It was only just a couple pressures. So that was really impressive. Um, yeah, he's a guy that, and he, and he only did that as, you know, his first year starting as basically a sophomore. So I thought that was really impressive. Um, so I think, I think he'll be able to yeah, I think he'll be able to do a, do well against kind of a bigger guy like Garvin, but against a guy like Trayvon Hill, who's got a bit more juice, got a bit more burst with his first step. It'll be interesting to see how Heck does against him. Yeah, definitely. Uh, moving on, I want to go ahead and uh, take over and move on to my what is my favorite matchup of the week, and that is the Nebraska-Colorado game. It is LaVisca Chenault versus Lamar Jackson. Now, Chenault is a first-round guy wide receiver by a lot of people i i'm not there yet with him but he definitely has some traits that are really interesting and he was used more as a traditional wide receiver in his first game but i i'd like to see that against some better competition and see how he deals with players who are actually going to be playing in the nfl more consistently and lamar jackson the nebraska corner is a rare specimen with his size and his speed i mean not, not many cornerbacks in the nfl are 6'3" and have the speed to stick with wide receivers down the field. I mean, obviously he's not a blazer, but he has more than enough to get by. And he needed to work on his technique and his physicality overall, but it's going to be a rare test for Chenault. And I'm very excited to see how he performs, especially with the more traditional wide receiver role he has this year. It's also going to be a great test for Jackson, as he's not going to face another first-round quality wide receiver this year, I don't think. Maybe he will, but... Either way, it's going to be a great test for him, and he can put himself on the name for first-round quarterbacks, possibly. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It'll be a great test for both of them. I also think that there's another Nebraska corner on the opposite side of Lamar Jackson, and DiCaprio Boodle, who's kind of, you know, he's a guy, and he's someone that at least I've heard mentioned kind of among the draft community. So, you know... Chenault's going to see, he'll see some of both of them. I expect Chenault to be moved around a lot, probably moved into the, into the slot uh, as well mm -hmm. a fair amount of time. So it's not like he's going to see one or the other all game. But right, Nebraska's going to stick to one side. Yeah, he's still going to see some of that. Like, you know, Lavishka Chenault, he's not a guy that, like, you hide against other corners at the collegiate level. You know, you, you, you can put him man on man and say, okay, let's see who wins. So. Right. You know, he'll he'll see some of them, or, yeah, some of them. And then, But, you know, if we're going to talk, we talk, we've talked a couple uh, wide receiver corner matchups already, but the biggest one this week, this coming week, is Colin Johnson versus Christian Fulton in that primetime Texas versus LSU game in Austin. Uh, Christian Fulton had an excellent year, the cornerback for LSU, in 2018. He's going to look to continue that run as a senior, um, I love him. I think he's really, really good. Uh, I, mean, I know there are a lot of people that think that. I, 
I think he's a great athlete with solid length. Uh, had an interception and nine pass breakups last year. Uh, honestly, he, he was probably a better corner than Greedy was last year. So that kind of just tells you all that you need to know about how good Christian Fulton is. And then Colin Johnson, massive boundary receiver for the Texas Longhorns and Sam Ellinger. Uh, he's about like 6'5", 6'6", 220-ish. Long strider with a giant catch radius who can make some really incredible catches. Um, we'll see if the size of Colin really bothers Christian Fulton. Yeah, that's definitely – it's also a matchup that I had circled to talk about, and I, if there's a good reason why. It's a very interesting matchup. I mean, Colin Johnson, even for his size, is more agile than you'd expect for wide receivers his size is what I would say. He's not uh, he, he's not fast, but he's not a plotter. He doesn't move slowly like some guys his size do. And also something that you just kind of touched on is Sam Ellinger in this matchup. Is he is he for real as a potential draftable quarterback? And facing off against this LSU defense, he made a great test. They have a solid pass rush. Good, they're good at all three levels: from cornerback, safety, linebacker. They have draftable prospects all over the field. How does Ellinger do? Is he actually a guy who could play at the next level? That's a great question in this matchup to me, and I'm excited to see what what he does. Yeah, I agree completely. And then I guess just to finish it off for me, I have a couple more that I think are kind of interesting, but I don't really want to go too in-depth on. Uh, one of them is Purdue linebacker Marcus Bailey going up against Vanderbilt running back Keyshawn Vaughn and Vanderbilt tight end Jared Pinckney. And uh, finally, Jacob Eason in his first real test uh, faces off with a very, against a very good Cal defense. And uh, a couple guys that I think we're going to talk about later on the back end in safeties, Jalen Hawkins and Ashton Davis. Uh, yeah, just uh, for me to finish up, I have um, I would just want to touch on Michael Warren versus Ohio State. You know, he's a real powerful, and I just want to see how he can perform when his team is going to be overwhelmed. I'm a little worried that the script might go against him and he doesn't get the touches that he that I'd like to see him get, but I'm excited to see how he works. And the other one is Travis Etienne versus Texas A&M and Willie Gay, who was suspended for the first game for not entirely clear reasons. Some said it might be something called Tudor Gate, which I'm not exactly sure what that was, but apparently is a thing at Texas A&M. But Willie Gay is an interesting linebacker prospect with a lot of speed, so seeing a matchup with a fast running back like ETN is going to be really interesting, especially since ETN is stronger than some give him credit for. Yeah, I think so, uh, excellent stuff. Oh, sorry. Good. Not good. I so, covered it. Uh, so to move on to our next segment, uh, I wanted to – I brought my – the top ten of my big board, and I just wanted us to go over it together and just talk about uh, who, who I have, where, and what kind of disagreements we have about it. So I figured I'd just like do them like two at a time, like say like nine and ten at once, and we can talk about them for a minute and then move on to the next two. All right. All right, so first up at ten, I have Trevon Diggs, my cornerback for Alabama, and at nine, I have Justin Herbert, the quarterback for Oregon. So Diggs is my top corner in the class, and as of right now, he's – Insanely good. He's super fast. He has good ball skills, good tech technically, and he's got good size to go along with everything else. And then Herbert, he's super inconsistent, but the flashes are insane. He threads a needle down the seam. He runs for 50 yards. There's really he can do anything that you want from a quarterback and and more. And it's just he needs to be more consistent. That's his biggest problem more than anything else. Yeah, I lo I love those two picks. Um... We'll talk about just my thoughts on get a little bit more into what I think of Justin Herbert a little bit later. But I love that you brought up Trevon Diggs. I think he's a top five cornerback as well. And that's not to say that like, you know, oh, I don't think he's a first rounder. In this class, you've got like five first round corners. And I think Diggs is one of them. So I, again, I, I love the size. I love the ball skills as a former receiver. And he showed it uh, against Duke. He had a pick. He was one of the guys on my, I guess you could say short list of uh, standout performers. He had a very good game, and I expect that to continue like the entire season. He probably would have been a you know first rounder top 50 selection if he didn't get hurt and declared last year. But I expect him to perform at a very high level this year. And uh, yeah, I like his I like his inclusion in your top 10. I think it makes sense. 
Yeah, I think that if he had declared last year, he probably would have been the first cornerback taken. Not entirely clear, but I think that that was a very strong possibility. Uh, and moving on to our next two is actually a double dip at wide receiver. I have Henry Ruggs, the wide receiver for Alabama, and C.D. Lamb, the wide receiver for Oklahoma. Ruggs is a speed demon. He has, and, but he's not just a speed demon like a Brandon Cooks or something like that. He also flashes really good hands, the ability to go up and get the ball. Uh, I'd really like to see him clean up his route running a little bit more, but overall there's a lot to like about him and a lot to develop. And Lamb is very a lot better as a route runner than Hup Ruggs, maybe not the athlete, but he also flashes crazy good hands, a lot of insane circus catches, and really good route running, especially coming from Oklahoma, where some guys come out really raw as a route runner. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, this wide receiver class is absolutely insane. So, you know, putting... Putting any, you know, putting those get those two on on there at kind of a little bit of the back end of the top ten makes a lot of sense. Uh, C.D. Lamb is a guy that I like, but I don't love on the same level of like a Henry Ruggs or a Jerry Judy. Uh, he's just not really the athlete, com- in my opinion, compared to either of those guys. Um, so I'm a little bit tempered on C.D. Lamb, but he still is a really good route runner. Uh, he's still got a really good body. Um, and obviously the the pedigree and the the college resume speaks for itself for C.D. Lamb. I've been pretty high on him since he broke out with Baker Mayfield in his freshman year, and I think he's you know a round one guy and a guy you take in round one. I just don't think I I I don't have him as highly as I think other people have him. So, and you know Henry Ruggs, uh, just to quickly touch on that dude is just insanely fast, uh, tough. Uh, a big receiver, kind of your, you know, he's not super beefed up, but he is, I do think he is kind of a prototypical X guy. He's going to be able to run past pretty much anyone. Uh, he's a 4-3 guy. Um, and he's a, he's another one of these receivers that's, you know, this this class of just extremely talented receivers that I think is, because of his crazy athleticism combined with his size, I think it kind of puts him a little bit above some of these other guys. Uh, yeah, that's all. That's, I understand your thoughts on Lamb. We disagree a little bit there, but you know, I think that there's a lot of cases to be made for different wide receivers. I'm not as high on Chenault as a lot of people are, and there's still a whole season left to play. Uh, moving on to 6 and 5, we have Andrew Thomas, uh, George Offensive Tackle at 6, and Grant Delpit, the safety for LSU, who we'll talk about more in after this segment. Uh, but Andrew Thomas is a Crazy good technical offensive tackle. He has everything that you want. He's got decent size, decent decent athleticism, really good athleticism actually. I think uh, obviously we'll have to wait for the combine to know for sure because like, sometimes for offensive tackles it isn't exactly clear the level that they're athletically. But Thomas looks more than athletic enough, and he shows really good technique for a college player, which is super awesome because it's very hard for NFL teams to develop develop offensive tackles right now. Yeah, uh, Andrew Thomas is my OT1 as well. I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Uh, the athleticism, he really, I noticed, he explodes out of his stance. He's super quick out of his stance. It allows him to get hands up early. Uh, allows him to win with his hands and his strength. So that's Absolutely. obviously great. Um, yeah, uh, technically, as you said, he's very good as well. I really like his feet. Um, just, I, I think the only, I guess, concern that you kind of have with Thomas is he doesn't have like freakishly long arms, but for me personally, it didn't stop. You know, Jonah Williams's shorter arms didn't stop me from having him as OT one. And uh, for Andrew Thomas, I, you know, I I think he's another really top tier offensive tackle prospect, and he's going to be in my top ten pretty much throughout the year, unless you know some random character stuff comes up or you know something crazy like that. But barring any uh, unforeseen, you know red flags he's gonna be uh he's gonna be ot1 and he's gonna be really up there on most people's boards uh yeah he's he's a beast and uh moving on we're gonna go into the top four more beasts his four is aj panesa uh the edge for iowa and three is Tua Tago vailoa the quarterback for alabama everyone knows him uh Epinesa is more uh he's Probably more of a 3-4 kind of end. I mean, not, there's 3-4 and 4-3, whatever, at this point. But he's not hes not really a stand-up rusher, but he's extremely powerful. He uses his hands really well. He's relentless. He's got solid athleticism. He's not 
some uber athlete like other players are coming out. But he's got everything that you want out of a guy who can really just come out and dominate all day long and just take over the line of scrimmage. And Tua, I mean, there's not – you. I could make an entire half-hour video about Tua, but just to boil it down, he's insanely accurate for a college quarterback. He generally makes good decisions. He's safe at the ball. He goes for the big play. He's incredibly fun. And while maybe he doesn't have the strongest arm out there and he is playing with an insane supporting cast – if we isolate him, he's still incredibly talented and easily my quarterback one right now. Yeah, uh, AJ Epinesa is a guy that I love, and you'll find out uh, later how much I love him. Um, and yeah, Tua is another guy that's I, you know, in my opinion, easily a top ten prospect in this class. Uh, I think that you know really shouldn't be any doubt. Uh, He's got a good enough arm. It's not crazy like some of the other quarterback prospects in this class, but you know, with with his ability to, you know, not only with his athleticism, but his touch, uh, his ball placement, it's all good. He's got really everything. He, I mean, he's got everything you need for a young quarterback to be able to develop in, into your franchise guy for the next, you know, ten, fifteen years. Um, I, the only thing, the only quite, uh, concern that I have for Tua is I want to see him play a little bit better against the top defenses, uh, against Clemson, Georgia, and LSU. Those were easily his three weakest games, and uh, those are the three best defenses he faced all year. So uh, I just want to, you know, see him get better at, uh, you know, reacting to what coverages give him. Uh, Georgia really mixed things up on him. Clemson and LSU threw him some curveballs as well, and it kind of gave him a little bit of trouble. I mean, he's still he's still talented enough where he's going to get his, but just you know, he needs he kind of needs to take that final step. But I mean, he's still a great prospect. Yeah, for sure. And the last two guys I think are top two at most people's boards at this point, and it's the first one is Chase Young, the edge for Ohio State. He's I already talked about it a little bit, but he's. An insane combination of speed, power, size, technique. He's everything you could want, and he could easily be the number one overall pick in the coming draft, depending on who gets the first pick. And then my top prospect in my big ward is Jerry Judy, the wide receiver for Alabama. Judy is just insanely refined. No other wide receiver I've scouted has been on his level uh, I've said this in private chats, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say it on the podcast. I think that if Jerry Judy was put in the NFL right now, he'd be a top five route runner. Obviously, once you get towards that like top 10, 15, it's really close. But I really think that Judy, all the little nuances that he does, his movement, it all is so smooth and clean that I don't see how he has much to improve on. I mean, that sounds like a negative thing, but he's just so good at everything that he's going to immediately step in and be a number one wide receiver, he is going to help a quarterback that's going to be a thousand yard guy right away. Yeah, I think the thing that makes both of these guys so special is that they just they just translate to the NFL immediately. I mean, day one, they are going to be stars in terms of, you know, Chase Young with all of his physical tools. And even, you know, he's got really good, he's got some damn good technique as well from what I saw. Um, Chase Young's obviously a guy I love. He'll be in my top 10. And Jerry Judy, I agree with you completely. My wide receiver one just kind of does everything at, you know, the highest level you could ask of a college prospect. And so, you know, I don't really think there needs to be a whole lot more discussion than that. Yeah, obviously when we get into their, like, position group specifically, we'll talk about more about them, which brings us into our next segment where we talk about a position group. And this week we're going to start with, I want to start with some of the less heralded positions in this draft. Obviously this one has some real stars, but the depth, the people aren't talking about some of the, the guys below the top one or two. And I think we need to work on that. So we're going to talk about the safety class. And so first off, I just want to get it out of the way. Let's just talk about Grant Delpit. Let's just start with the top. Uh, Delpit is insane. Uh, Jerry, so he is coming out of the same defense as Jamal Adams a few years ago few years ago who is a very good prospect but Grant Delpit is just like Jamal Adams on steroids he is insane he's very fast very reactive very strong he's basically anything you could want out of a more box safety kind of player and there's really 
not a lot about him that I want to see him improve on because he's already so good. I wish that he could be a little bit better in coverage, but and like in more of a deep coverage role. I mean, but he's insanely good already. Yeah, Grant Delpit. He's safety one. I think, in my opinion, he's a top two prospect in this entire class. Uh, I just I love the impact he makes on defense. He honestly plays kind of like a Troy Polamalu out there. He just does everything. He takes the ball away. Uh, he can you know tackle and be a force in the run, against the run as well. I mean, in coverage, he's just an absolute animal out there. Instincts are great. Uh, I just don't. As as a safe, you know, we've seen some great safety prospects come out of the past uh, few years. Guys like Jamal Adams, uh, Malik Hooker, Derwin James, Minka Fitzpatrick. Uh, you know, guys I liked last year, like Nasir Adderley and Darnell Savage, who was safety one uh, in the NFL draft last year to Green Bay. And I like Delpit more than all of them. I think he's an unbelievable safety prospect, and I, you know, the impact that he's going to be able to bring a defense as just kind of an ultimate chess piece, I think is going to, it could transform a defense. Yeah, for sure. All right, do you have a safety you'd like to bring up next? Uh, well, let's just get the other guy, the other top guy out of the way, uh, Xavier McKinney from Alabama. Uh, I think he's a top 15 prospect in this class. I have him dangerously close to the top 10, actually. I really love his game. Uh, I think he he's not afraid to tackle anyone in run support. I love that. I love his athleticism. Uh, had, I believe, two picks and nine or ten pass breakups last year, which is really nice considering his role. He kind of played, you know, you'd call him a strong safety, but he played a ton of slot. Um, not quite like the star role that uh, Shaheem Hines, I believe his name is, played last year and Minka played before him, but still kind of played in and around the box as a slot and, uh, kind of all over the place as a strong when they uh as a strong safety he had you know a few different roles but I think when you take a look at the athleticism uh the tackling and even you know the ball skills too especially on a lot of stuff you know 10 to 20 yards I think Xavier McKinney is a very 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 good safety prospect I mean yeah I I think he actually does kind of remind me of uh, Minka Fitzpatrick a little bit as a kind of guy who was moved around a lot. He played a lot of slot, played some deep, played in the box, just like a linebacker. And that, that was a lot of stuff Fitzpatrick did, and it did raise some questions about Fitzpatrick's ability to uh, where he would play. But, I, I mean, I think that wherever you put McKinney, he's going to have an impact. And uh, once so uh, after talking about McKinney, let's move on to another safety who, once again, uh, is some questionable role. Uh, and we're going to talk about Isaiah Simmons. So uh, we're going to probably talk about him when we talk about linebackers too, but figured we'd just bring him up in safeties because he could play there in the NFL. And really what is the difference between a safety and a big, li a small linebacker in the NFL, in today's NFL? I mean, he is insanely, he's, he's one of those guys who has a very wide range of outcomes to me, but his, his flashes of greatness are so high that I could see him easily rising into a top 15 to 20 pick and he really has a lot of room to grow, but he has shown so much on the way there. And I'm really excited to see how he continues to play this season. Yeah, I think you know, take a look at the size and the athleticism that Isaiah Simmons has, and it's apparent you know, what his role looks like in the NFL. And he's kind of already doing that at Clemson for Brett Venable's defense. And that, you know, I mean, this guy is going to be, he is kind of like, he has the tools to be, like, the perfect guy in dime packages on third and long um, in the NFL. So he's got he's got a clear role in today's kind of pace and space NFL where he's going to be able to chase down a lot of these athletic running backs, athletic tight ends. Uh, he'll be able to make plays in space against uh, wide receivers. Uh, I, you know, you can play, you know, he is kind of like a safety hybrid-ish. I think of him more as, like, a linebacker, even though he'd be like a smaller linebacker, I think you just, in today's NFL, you just get, you kind of can get as many of those, as many coverage guys out there as possible, and I think Simmons fits that bill, and, you know, even though he's kind of a louder guy, he's got a really good frame, he's got, he's, he, he's not like super lanky or anything, so 
I think he can hold up as a linebacker in, you know, like in nickel and, you know, on first down or, you know, maybe second down or, you know, especially a lot of teams throw on second down nowadays, but, you know, just in general running situations, I don't think he's a guy that really, you know, need to take off the field at his peak. Yeah, that, that, that all makes sense. I mean, he's, he's just, you know, there is a lot to love about him. And, you know, you still have questions about his development and where he plays at the next level, obviously. But just, like, his, there's so few players like him. And so it's really exciting to see guys like him coming out to the draft because you don't know where he's going to end up going or what he's going to end up doing. So it's a, it's a big projection, but it's also really fun. All right, so who, uh, what about you? What, who would you also do? Like well, I mentioned them a bit earlier uh, when going through the match that we were looking forward to in week two, and that is the pair of Cal Bears safeties, Jalen Hawkins and Ashton Davis. Both of them are fifth-year seniors. Um, Ashton Davis got has gotten a lot of love from Dane Brugler on Twitter, and, you know, I kind of was like, okay, you know, let's see – Let's kind of see what Ashton Davis is all about. And I kind of get it. I really like Ashton Davis. He's a he's more of a true free safety prospect. Um, he's a track guy, so he's super fast. I mean, he's going to run at least four fours. Uh, he's he's kind of a burner on the back end for the, for the defense. Uh, he's got good ball skills. Or actually, he's got really good ball skills. He had, I want to say four interceptions. Yeah, he had four interceptions last year. Uh, I believe five passes defense. Um, the only, I think the biggest concern with Davis is he's got a really lanky and slight frame. He's like 6'1", maybe 190. Uh, tackling can be an issue for him at the, you know, it's kind of the last line of defense just because of his size. But I do think he takes good angles to the football. So that's something where maybe kind of, you know, as he bulks up a little bit more, and keeps that speed, he'll be able to be a reliable last line of defense kind of guy. Ashton Davis is a guy that I really like. If you haven't checked him out, I highly recommend him. The safety class really, you know, depending on what you think of Isaiah Simmons, the safety class really falls off after Xavier McKinney, and I think Ashton Davis has a chance to rise as part of a very good Cal defense. Uh, his partner in crime, uh, Jalen Hawkins, he's a bit of a bigger dude. Um, he's, uh, I'd say, probably, probably 210. You know, 205, a big 205 to a 210. Uh, he's a guy that I worry about his range, but he's able to play really good. I, I like his ability to play downhill. Um, it's weird because he doesn't really seem that fast, like over top, over the top, and even in, uh, you know, if they have uh, both Davis and Hawkins up there. Uh, you know, each with their uh, half half uh, a side of the field. Um, I don't think Hawkins has you know great range, but he's able to really accelerate downhill and make plays that way. Another guy with great ball skills and great hand-eye coordination. Six picks, including three in the bowl game against TCU. Um, he's a thicker guy. He's a, a better tackler than Davis. Um, I think they're both interesting guys to keep an eye on. Uh, yeah, the last the last guy that I want to go over in terms of the safety class is someone who like simultaneously seems to me to be getting like more buzz than is expected and less buzz than is expected, and it's Ohio State safety Jordan Fuller. Uh, I don't know if you've gotten around to him yet. Uh, he's uh, he's not a great tackler, I'll say that much, but he's a lot of fun as a cover three safety that can play both up high and down in the box. He, he has a lot of potential, and I think that he really improved from 2017 to 2018, and I'm really excited to see if he can improve continuing forward. I mean, he he has good athleticism. He has solid ball skills, and I just I just think in the safety class, once again, we said it falls off. I think a guy like him could really rise as this smart player who can just kind of do whatever you need a safety to do in a cover three scheme, which a lot of teams run a lot of cover three. So he really, I think, is going to be a, a better NFL, maybe a better NFL player than he was a college player. And I'm, I'm really excited. I mean, he has he had a lot of tackles for Ohio State, and I expect the same. And hopefully 
some more interceptions and some more highlight reel plays. Yeah, Jordan, Jordan Fuller's a guy that I've never, honestly, I've never really had a solid opinion on. I've seen a lot of him as an Ohio State fan, so I've watched a lot of him in passing, but, you know, I, I could never get a concrete handle on, them. Like, on him. Like you said, not a great tackler. Um, but I think, you know, I love his athleticism, so I think, or I really like his athleticism, so, you know, I think at least, at the very least, I think he projects well as a special teamer, uh, because of just, you know, his, you know, he has a lot of experience kind of playing at a high level, and I think that's kind of, that might be his path to getting playing time early is on special teams, because I think teams are going to look at, you know, how he runs and how fat, and, the fact that he's a fast kid, he'll be like, okay, you know, mate, we'll develop more of this coverage stuff, and uh, he'll be able to make an impact early on special teams. But, yeah, I think he's a guy that projects as a versatile safety that can kind of, can, can you know, become a jack-of-all-trades guy. Um, so, the let's see, the last guy that I wanted to talk about is uh, a guy who's going to face off against some some interesting wide receivers next week, and that's Brandon Jones from Texas. Uh, kind of a bigger guy, uh, six foot to six foot one, about two ten, or maybe a little bit more than that. He's a bit of a bigger guy. I really, uh, really good athlete. I think you know he's a guy you can play up top, uh, taking you know taking half a half a side. He's not exactly a true center fielder, or at least we haven't seen that because Texas has Caden Stearns, and Caden Stearns is awesome. Um, but Brandon Jones is pretty good in his own right. He has the size to tackle, although I think that's, you know, I don't remember really loving his tackling when I watched him, but I, you know, it's something that I think he can be really good at because of his athleticism and his size. Um, I think, you know, as a cover two guy, he has experience kind of, play, you know, playing cover two or cover four. Um, so, and obviously, you know, as in, as an underneath guy in cover three or maybe as a robber in cover one, I think there's some potential value there because, you know, he's kind of the guy with the size to at least compete against tight ends over the middle. So Brandon Jones is another interesting guy to keep your eye on this year. Um, uh, a senior, but uh, nonetheless a guy that could rise in a shallow safety class. I think that... Uh... Jones is more of a more of a run defender kind of guy. I I had worries about him athletically moving, like being able to stick with wide receivers and stuff like that. So I I, I predict him almost as like a like a Jonathan Cyprian at his best in the NFL, as moving into the NFL. And I, obviously, I do have some concerns about his tackling, but I think that overall he's uh, he's better against the run than he is against the pass. And uh, I mean, I think that he could be a guy who rises as some team some teams really like getting that kind of physical presence who can really i mean he can really bring the wood sometimes and can really be that force in the box as a safety and i think that 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 is kind of what i project brandon jones towards and i think that some teams will really like that and will be excited to get him So uh, I believe uh, I believe that that is it for our uh, the debut episode of the Draft Duos podcast. Would you have anything else you'd like uh, to? Say? No, I think we got off to a good start. We covered a lot of stuff, and uh, it was it was good. I had a lot of fun. Uh, all right. So next week we will be covering. Uh, we'll we'll still be doing players who stood out most in the previous week of college football. Uh, we'll be covering week two, of course. Oh, against you once again. We're doing the matchups we look forward to. Uh, we'll do something else in chase in place of the big board discussion. Not sure what yet. And then, uh, what position do you want to do instead of safeties next week? Do a step um, defense or go to offense? Let's go to offense next time. Um, you know, let's do some running backs because I have a lot of thoughts on this running back class, and I, I imagine you do too. It's a really interesting class. It's, uh, I mean, we would have to, if we really want to cover the running backs in full, we'd have to just dedicate an entire episode to it. But we'll do them quick hit, and we'll get through everything. So next week we will do the matchups we're looking forward to. We'll do the best player, the players of the week, week two, uh, something else in place of big board, and we will do a running back discussion. So thank everyone who listened. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. This was the Draft Duos podcast with Milk and LB3. Uh, thank you very much.
Uh, I'd love to hear reviews and anything that you thought that you changed. Thank you very much.